Well, welcome again, and special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. So this is a picture of Andrew Brunson and his wife, Noreen, who for 23 years served as church planters and pastors, as missionaries in the country of Turkey. They planted and pastored six different churches while they were there uh, and had a very fruitful ministry for the majority of their time there. But over the last few years in Turkey, they experienced an incredible hardship. It was October of 2016, and they had been out of town for a few days, and they were returning home, and they found a notice on their church door that said they needed to report to the police station immediately. And so being good citizens, they did the next day. They went to the police station, and as they sat down to talk to the officer there, they were informed that they were going to be deported. And on their little form, they were given a classification of G82, which meant that they were a threat to national security. And they were stunned by this designation. They were stunned that they were being deported. They had great relationships in their community for the 23 years they lived there. And as they're filling out paperwork, as they're understanding what's going to happen to them, the the individual that they're talking with received a phone call and picked up the phone and said, "Uh uh uh-huh, uh-huh, hung up the phone and said, in addition to being deported, you're first going to be arrested because you have been uh, tied to terrorist activity in our country. And they were just blown away by this. All, All of these allegations were false, but from there, they were put in a prison for 13 days as all of this was getting sorted out before deportation, before you know, are these charges formal? Are we going to be going to trial? And after 13 days, uh, Andrew's wife, Noreen, was released, but Andrew continued to stay in prison. He was continued to remain captive, and he did so for another two years. The charges that were filed against him would have led to a three-lifetime sentence in solitary confinement without any sort of parole if he was convicted of these charges of him being tied to a coup to overthrow Turkish Turkish government officials. And so just absolutely stunned. Now, after her release, uh, Noreen fervently tried to find ways to free her husband, connecting with anybody and everybody they could. And during those two years, Andrew went through, as you might imagine, a whole swell of emotions, up and down, in and out, just confused, angry, just outright, like, what in the world is going on? And in the, he said in the first in an interview, in the first year he was there, all he wanted was out. And he said to the Lord, like, if in some weird way this is a part of your plan for me, if you have something for me in and through this, I want no part of this. I just want to be out of here and back with my family. And he lived in that place, he said, for an entire year. But then somewhere along the way, as he moved from year one to year two, it was like the Lord spoke to him. And he said, Andrew, do you, do you trust me? Do you trust that I'm working this out for my glory and your good? But what if there's an inheritance that I have for you? But what if there is something on the other side of this hardship that I'm going to invite you into? that will be an inheritance, that that you will experience something so great, so wonderful, that you you could never imagine it in the here and now. And he said somewhere along the way, after that encounter with the Lord, his mind started to change. His mind started to shift, and he began to embrace this idea of being right where he was, trusting that God was with him, that God was for him, and somehow God was going to work all this out for his good. So after two years in jail, there was a trial date set where he would be formally tried and um, formally prosecuted, and that trial date rolled around, and all of these charges were thrown against him, and he was actually convicted. He was convicted of being a part of this terrorist activity, again, all of which was false. He was convicted of being a part of a coup to overthrow these government officials. But oddly enough, as they started the appeal process, the travel ban, he was you know, temporarily released from prison, and his travel ban was lifted, which meant he could leave the country even though he'd been convicted because he was in a process of appeal. And the first thing that he did was go to the airport, get on a plane, and fly back to America, and hire legal help to get all those charges dropped and to live again as a free man. And 
from that experience, he now has had this incredible ministry of traveling the world, telling his story of God's faithfulness, of God's provision, and what it means to persevere through hardship and difficulty in suffering, and started a ministry with his wife called Wave Starters, where, again, they have this platform to spread the gospel and tell the story of God's faithfulness, even in the most difficult of circumstances. And I wonder, if you're here this morning, and somebody asked you, hey, would you like to have a faith like that, a faith that can endure a wrongful imprisonment, a faith that can endure a targeted attack, would you say, yeah, yeah, I want that kind of faith? Would anybody here this morning say yes to that? Now, sometimes we, we think to ourselves, well, faith like that is reserved for extraordinary Christians, those who go out into the missions field, those who go to third world countries, to those who travel the world doing hard things for the Lord. But the New Testament tells us that the faith that is given to them is available to all of us. And maybe you're here this morning and you're feeling like my faith is shaky or my faith is weak, my faith is fading, and what I need is somebody to show me how to re-engage my faith so it can be strong once again. If that's you this morning, or if you're here saying, I desire to have a faith like that, I believe John 16 is a reminder to us that the faith we all long for is available to us in the here and now, and it's not something reserved for those who are extraordinary professional Christians, but it's something given to the everyday follower of Jesus. Now, we're in this place in John 16, on the back half of John 16, which is part of a section in John's gospel, chapter 13 through 17, where Jesus is having his final night with his disciples before he goes to the cross. And the setting for this evening is a meal. This, Jesus is having dinner with his disciples, and going into this evening and into this meal, the disciples don't know it's their last night with Jesus. They don't know that this is the last time they will spend with Jesus before he is executed. But during the middle of that meal, Jesus springs this news on them, and instantly they're grieved, they're overwhelmed, and they're distraught. Jesus starts to say things like, I'm leaving. He doesn't quite tell them he's going to the cross, but he says he's not going to be with them anymore. He says, I'm leaving. I'm going to a place where you cannot come. You will look for me, but you won't be able to find me. And this causes the disciples to ask all sorts of questions. Why not? Where are you going? How come we can't come? And they're actually confused because what they were anticipating was that as they head towards Jerusalem during the Passover, that Jesus was going to launch a revolt to establish his kingdom, and they were going to rule and reign in Jerusalem with him. But yet now he's telling them that he's leaving. And they're also confused because Jesus is saying things that don't necessarily make sense to them. Specifically, something he says in chapter 16, starting in verse 16. This is what we read. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Now, if I'm a disciple, this statement would confuse me because Jesus just said, I'm leaving I'm going to a place where you won't see me. I'm going to a place where you cannot come. You will look for me, and you won't be able to find me. And now he's saying, oh, you won't see me, but then you actually will see me. And again, if I'm sitting at this dinner table, I'd be like, well, Jesus, which is it? Like, are you leaving us or are you not? Because it sounds like you are, but here you're saying we will actually see you again. What does this mean? And the disciples' confusion becomes evident in verse 17. At this, some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father? They're saying, what does all of this mean? Now, when you're in a place of confusion, that can be wildly frustrating, right? If you're in a conversation with somebody and it's clear that you're speaking past each other, you're on two different levels, and you're just not connecting, that can be wildly confusing. It can also be confusing when you have this issue in front of you that doesn't make sense, and you're working really hard to try and figure it out, and there doesn't seem to be a solution to the problem, and you're troubleshooting all these things, and you think to yourself, there's got to be a way for me to understand this, but I just can't. Anybody been there before? Yeah. When you're in the midst of confusion with no solution, 
it can bring about frustration. So earlier this year, uh, Becky and I came home at the end of our day. I came home from work. She was out running errands with the kids. We met back at the house at 5 o'clock, starting to get dinner ready. And she says, hey, I almost got into an accident today. I was like, you did? What happened? She's like, I actually didn't even know that I almost got into an accident. I was at a stoplight, and this lady pulled up beside me, and she signaled to me to roll down my window, and she said, hey, all of your brake lights have gone out. All of your brake lights aren't working, and I almost ran into you at the stoplight just before this one because I didn't realize you were slowing down. I was like, that's not good. Like, that really could get you into an accident. So that was like a Thursday. I said, this weekend, I'm going to figure this out. So it was Saturday. I actually drove where we live in our neighborhood. There's an auto parts store just a couple blocks away. So I drove to the auto parts store and just parked in their driveway. And the first thing I did to troubleshoot this problem is anything any good millennial would do. I turned to YouTube. I just started Googling and, and going to YouTube, like, what happens or how do you fix all your brake lights going out? And the first thing I found was a video that said, check the fuses. It could be a bad fuse. So I went and checked all the fuses. I went into the store, bought some new fuses, replaced some fuses. Nothing happened. I'm in this, like, ongoing conversation with the guy behind the counter every time I walk in, and he's kind of tracking my progress. And then I say to him, hey, the fuses didn't work. And he's like, hey, you know, there's actually a switch underneath your brake pedal that when you push your brakes, it triggers a button that actually turns on your brake lights, and sometimes that switch can fail, and we sell those for like 15 bucks. I was like, great, let's get one of those, thinking this is going to fix my problem. So we install the switch, super easy to do, and then I call to him like, hey, can you stand behind the car so I can hit the brakes and see if they light up? And so I'm like pumping the brakes. He's like, hey, when are you going to hit the brakes? I'm like, I'm doing it. I'm pumping them. He's like, nothing's happening. And I'm like so confused now. I've like tried all the things. I've looked up, you know, half hour of YouTube videos. I just don't know what to do. And he comes to me and he says, hey, you know, um, could it be that the light bulbs are just out? Like they have died. I was like, well, that wouldn't make sense because they all seem to go out at the same time. It's like, well, what if we were to just try that. I was like, yeah, that's not going to work, but okay, pal. And so we went and bought a light bulb. We installed it in, and I start to hit the brake pedal. He's like, hey, everything's lighting up like a Christmas tree. It was just that the bulbs were bad. That was like two hours of confusion and frustration because I didn't try the most obvious solution. And when you're in that place, when you're working really hard to try and figure something out, it can be wildly frustrating and confusing. And the thing in this moment that is confusing the disciples is the phrase that Jesus is using in a little while. We see it again in verse 18. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Now, if you were to read this passage straight through, the phrase a little while would leap off the page. Jesus uses that phrase, or John writes that phrase out seven times within the span of of four verses, and it's wildly frustrating to the disciples. It's kind of like that moment when you're in a long car ride as a kid. You're on a road trip, and you want to know when you're going to get to where you're going, and you start asking your parents, hey, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? And your parents know that it's still quite a ways away, and they don't want to have to navigate and deal with all the complaints that are going to come their way if they tell you the exact time. So what do they say? Ah, we'll be there in a little while. And you're like, what in the world does that mean? The disciples are in that same place with Jesus. What does he mean by a little while? What is this all about? And Jesus can see their frustration, and he can see their confusion, and he comments on it, verse 19. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more? And then, after a little while, you will see me? Are you asking about that? Now, what's even more frustrating than being in a place of confusion and not being able to figure out why this thing isn't working or why this miscommunication is happening, what's even more frustrating than just being in that moment is having somebody close by who knows the solution, who has clarity, but they decide not to help. That's one of my kids' biggest frustration right now with math. Like, they don't understand math. Their teacher clearly knows how to do it, but the teacher won't help them. The teacher just like, continue to work at it, continue to persevere, continue to try. You'll get it. And she's like, ah, I just want her to tell me what to do. 
When somebody's present who knows how to solve the problem or bring clarity to the confusion and they don't help, that only adds to the frustration. And it kind of seems like that's what Jesus is doing here because he doesn't actually answer the question. He actually brings it up. Oh, are you confused by this? Are you wondering what I mean by this? But then he actually doesn't address it. He goes on to say this in verse 20. Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve. So not only are the disciples confused, they're also in a place of grief. The disciples are grieved. And Jesus has already named this. Chapter 16, verse 6. He says, you are all filled with grief. He can see the grief on their face just because he's told them he's leaving. And then he says, your grief will continue. And then he adds insult to injury by saying, oh, while you grieve, the world is going to rejoice. And the way that Jesus says this, it kind of sounds like the thing that's causing the disciples grief will be the same thing that causes the world to rejoice. Because when you're in a state of grief, it's really hard to be with people who are celebrating. Especially when the thing that they are celebrating is the thing that brings you grief. It's kind of like that moment at the end of the Super Bowl. When the confetti explosion happens and the confetti shower happens. And you're on the opposing team that lost the game. And what you're walking in and walking through is the celebration of the other team with their colors of confetti in the air, the coach getting the Gatorade bath, players on the field doing snow angels in the confetti, and you're getting showered with all of their colors, and you're actually having to watch them celebrate as you walk past them to go to the locker room. I've never seen an opposing player of a Super Bowl team that loses join in the celebration of the other team. I'm so happy for you. This is the best day for you. This is wonderful. They're like, I'm out of here as fast as I can. Because when you're grieving and somebody else is celebrating and the thing they're celebrating causes your grief, you're like, I just want to get out of here so fast. And Jesus is saying, you will grieve and the world will rejoice. And it could be the thing that causes your grief is the thing that they celebrate. Now, these two things, confusion and grief, can significantly impact faith formation in our life. Again, if we want to have people who have this incredible life of faith, it's a natural to ask, well, how does that happen? And grief and confusion have a significant impact on that. Now, on one level, grief and confusion can hinder faith formation. Sometimes it's because we perceive that the purpose of faith is to solve life's problems and make my life better. It's easy to believe that, especially as you read through the Gospel of John and you read stories about Jesus giving a free miraculous meal to 5,000 people on a hillside with five loaves of bread and two fish. It's easy to believe that when Jesus heals a lame beggar who's been laying poolside for his entire life or gives sight to a blind man, or heals somebody's internal emotional trauma, and he brings them back to full health, you think, that should be happening to me too. Or in chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, it's easy to believe that following Jesus is about making my life better and solving all my problems. Especially because the New Testament repeatedly names that Jesus is king. And in the Gospels, when Jesus does these miracles, It's a signpost and a signifier about this is what life is like when Jesus is king. These miracles capture the nature and the essence of his kingdom. So naturally, we believe, well, that should be happening to me. But when life's troubles hit and life is hard and you're pulled into a department Zoom meeting with the CEO of the company and he tells you that this whole department is being eliminated and we don't have the funds to pay a severance, You're left hung out to dry, and you're like, Jesus, where are you in the midst of this? Like, why would I follow you if this is my experience following you? What is this all about? When we approach our faith, thinking that faith in my life is intended to make my life better, when that doesn't happen, it can hinder the formation of faith. But oddly enough, at the same time, if we have the right perspective and we hit hard times in life, hardship actually has the ability to help faith development. 
But in order for it to help, it requires that we have a certain perspective of the world, specifically that the world we live in, every square inch, every corner of it is broken. And the brokenness of our world is too big for any one person to fix. When we sit in the weightiness of the brokenness of our world, it's like, oh, how is this ever going to get better? In our modern age, we live with this illusion of progress, that things are getting better because we live with technology, and technology has made our lives easier, and it's extended life expectancy, and it's brought all of this convenience to us. It's easy to think, yeah, the world is getting better, but at the core of our world is the sin and brokenness that we bring to our world, that we bring with us everywhere we go. So it's not just that we have this perception that the world is broken, and it's far too broken for any one person to fix. It's also having the perspective that we contribute to the breakdown of our world. We are people who daily contribute to the breakdown of relationships in our life. When somebody cuts me off on the freeway, and my impulse is to step on the gas to come by them, to give them an explicit gesture, to know that I'm mad at what they've done. Like, all I'm doing is propagating the violence in our world. Maybe I'm not swerving to try and run them off the road. But that internal rage that's being ignited in my soul sometimes does come out and damage the relationships of the people closest to me. We are all guilty of the breakdown of our world. And we all have this realization that the world is not the way that it's supposed to be. And so sometimes we experience hardship and confusion and grief due to our own making because of the foolish, sinful things we do. But sometimes, again, because the world is broken, it just comes our way like a colossal punch in the gut. And the book of Job is a perfect example of that. Job, one of the wealthiest, most righteous men on earth, has everything he could ever want and more, and one day loses it all. He's told by a servant, as he's just living his life, that all of his oxen and donkeys have been raided and hauled off by a foreign army, and the foreign army killed all of his servants who were tending to them, and he's the only one who survived to come and tell Job. As he's telling him that, another servant shows up and says, hey, all of your sheep have been obliterated by some supernatural fire from heaven, and it laid out all of your servants, and I'm the only one who survived to come tell you. And then in that moment, another servant shows up and says, hey, all of your camels have been attacked and ransacked by another foreign army, and they killed all the servants who were tending your camels, and I'm the only one who survived to come tell you. And then in that moment, while he's still speaking, another servant shows up and says, hey, all of your kids were having a party in one of their homes, and the whole house collapsed, killed everybody in it, and I'm the only one who survived to tell you about it. All of that in one day. Talk about a colossally bad day. Not because Job did anything wrong, but just because our world is broken. And then his health fails. Boils and sores cover his body, and his wife says, you should just curse God and die. Now, the thing in that moment, in that story for Job, is he's never told why it happened. In our modern age, when suffering and hardship hit, we oftentimes want to ask why. The Bible rarely asks why. The Bible asks the question, what next? How do I respond to this? And what you see of many people in the scriptures who are quote-unquote heroes of the faith, the thing that they do next after they work through pain, confusion, and grief is they trust somehow that God is good in the midst of it. See, when we walk through hardship and pain and suffering, it puts us in a situation where we can't fix things. We don't have the power to make things better. But it also puts us in a situation where we're looking for the one who can. Because we have this belief deep in our core that there is somebody out there who put all this together. Really, could this have happened by accident? And if this God is a good and gracious God, there's no way that he can be relishing in our pain and suffering. He has to be working a plan to put this back together. So I'm going to go on a search for who that God is and what he's doing to put this situation in this world to rights. And fortunately, God didn't stand far off and expect us to go look for him. He stepped in and made a move towards us 
in the person of Jesus Christ. See, what John is saying in this section is that faith formation happens in hardship. Faith formation happens in hardship because when we have the right perspective of the world, when we have the right perspective of ourselves in this world, it gives us the ability to say, hey, there is one out there who can do what I can't do in putting this world back together. Now, one of the other perspectives you have to have in order for faith to be formed in hardship is, a, is an understanding that the grief and confusion and difficulty that we face in light of eternity is temporary. And that could be why John, seven times in four verses, repeats the phrase, in a little while. Now, that phrase is directly referring to the resurrection. It says in verse 16, in a little while you will see me no more, because Jesus will be in the tomb, locked away, as good as dead, and it will cause the disciples an immense measure of grief and sorrow. But then he says, but in a little while after, you will see me. Because Jesus will conquer death. He will defeat the grave. He will start the process of ushering new creation at the resurrection. So it means in the temporary, in the here and now, our pain and our suffering is temporary. Other writers of the New Testament capture this idea too. It's not just here in John. You see it in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. Paul is writing about his hardship. He's writing about his suffering. And he goes on to say, for our light and momentary troubles. It's just light. It's momentary. They are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. It's light. It's momentary. It's just for a little while. Peter captures this in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. He says, now, for a little while, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So the question is, what are the trials that you're facing today? And how are they impacting your faith? Are they hindering the development of your faith because your perspective is, hey, this should be working to make my life easier. Is it hindering that because you have that perspective? Or are you able to have the perspective that, yeah, life, life is hard, no matter how you slice it. For everybody, e even those who seem to have it all, like life is hard for everybody. And so in my hardship, I'm continually looking for the one who has the power and who has the ability to work things out for my good and his glory. And Jesus in this passage, he uses a metaphor to try and capture the temporary nature of our difficulties. Continuing on in verse 20, he says, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But yet when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child has been born into this world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take your joy away. Jesus uses the metaphor of, of childbirth to capture this idea of our grief one day turning to joy. I'll never forget the birth of our first daughter, Kate. I mean, it is seared in my memory. I remember driving to the hospital at two in the morning, freaking out, like, what's going to happen? I'm not okay. I'm not ready for this. Asking Becky, how are you doing? She's like, I'm fine. And I'm like, I don't believe you because I'm internally freaking out. A few months prior, I had a good friend who just had their first child delivered. And he was like, Brian, it was terrible. It was horrible. You're not going to be able to survive. Get all the nurses on the floor in the room with you. It's ground zero. I almost didn't make it. And that's what I'm expecting to happen. Becky was a champ in childbirth. And all the anguish, all the fear, all the concern that I had as soon as Kate popped out just seemed to melt away. I forgot about all the pain that Becky had during labor to push that baby out. I mean, it was just like gone from my memory, all the pain and suffering that she went through, just instantly away, right? Because you have this little precious gift, and it's like, oh, this is amazing. And it illustrates that oftentimes good things come through a hard road. 
and come through challenges. Anything good in life usually comes with some measure of grit, of determination, of hard work. And Jesus is saying, it might be hard, but it's temporary. And in a little while, your grief will turn to joy. The other thing he says is that your confusion will become clear. Your confusion will turn to clarity. He says this, jumping ahead a few verses to verse 25. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. And all of a sudden, the disciples start to see clearly and hear clearly. Verse 29, then the disciples said, now you're speaking clearly without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not need even to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. And Jesus' response is, do you now, in verse 31, do you now believe? See, what you're seeing in this passage in real time, is the formation of faith in the disciples. Did they believe before this moment? Certainly. Jesus names that. You have believed in me. I mean, they've seen all these amazing things firsthand that have caused them to put their confidence in Jesus, turn their back on everything else in life, and follow him wholeheartedly. But yet, their faith is still being formed. And that's true for all of us. Faith is a journey. It's not a destination. We're continually exploring new realities of who God is, new, newer depths to what does it mean to follow him and believe in him. And not only does grief turn to joy and confusion come to clarity, but we also become one with him as we pursue him in hardship. Stepping back to verse 23, it says, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Now Jesus isn't saying that he's a genie in a bottle. That If you get this lamp, you rub the lamp, out comes the genie. He gives you an infinite wish, infinite wishes, and you can have whatever you want. Rather, he's capturing that when you pursue Jesus in hardship, And when your faith grows through difficulty, what happens is you start to become one with Jesus. Namely, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, we take on the mind of Christ. So we start to perceive and see the world the way that Jesus does. And our intuition mirrors the intuition of Jesus. The things we pray for are the types of things that Jesus would pray for. The things we desire are the types of things that Jesus desires. We become one with him in spirit, in mind. That's the metaphor that Paul uses to describe our spiritual walk with Jesus, that we become one with Christ, that we become united with Christ, that we are found in him. And so when we pursue him in difficulty, not only does grief turn to joy and confusion to clarity, but we become one with Jesus and we cling to him because we have nothing else. And the reason that we do that is because we know through the scriptures that Jesus experiences hardship at a whole nother level than we ever experience it. Again, he doesn't step back and watch the world burn. He comes into the world and takes on the hardship, the pain, the suffering, and the difficulty of this world in order to reverse it and bring about restoration and renewal of all things. And that's where Jesus finishes this passage, verse 32. A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home, referring to how the disciples will abandon him when he goes to the cross. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Jesus goes to the cross being abandoned by his best friend, having the weight of the sin of this world heaped on him as though he's the one who's responsible for it all. Actually, on the cross, it says here that this father was with him, but he cries out to his father on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Being completely separated from his father in that moment. Also, we can take hold of the good news of what he says in verse 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. 
You have peace available to you in hardship. You have joy that you can access in suffering. He says, I say this so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You can take that to the bank. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. We know the end of the story. We know that Jesus wins. He's not walking the earth in the here and now. He's ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his hour to return when the time is right for him to set all things right. So in the here and now, even though life is hard, even though life is difficult and messy and challenging, we may never be locked up in a Turkish prison for two years, but we all are going to walk our own road of hardship. And the reality is that you have the ability to have extraordinary supernatural faith in this life in the here and now, even in the face of difficulty and hardship because of what Jesus has done for you, because of the supernatural power that's extended to you through his spirit in you, and his invitation in the difficulty is to come to him, to put your burdens at his feet, to pick up his yoke that is easy and light, to trust that he is with you, he is for you, and somehow in the midst of your mess, he's making all things new. And so the way that we're going to finish this morning is by going before the Lord's table. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up front as we get ready to go before the Lord's table. Because in this simple meal, we have a reminder that, yes, life is hard and messy. And the purpose of our faith is not to make all of our problems go away. The purpose of our faith is to shape us to be more like Christ, who can move through difficulty, who can move through hardship, knowing that he is with us, and he's working things out for our good and for his glory. And so it's a a meal that's a reminder that our world is broken. It reminds us that we have contributed to the breakdown of God's world through our own sin, and that Jesus has conquered sin. He has conquered death. So those things no longer define us, but through his resurrection, we have access to freedom and new life. And so this meal stands as an invitation for those who are followers of Jesus, to come forward and proclaim and declare through receiving these elements that this is what I'm staking my ground on. Like, this is what I'm taking to the bank with me. Like, this is what I wholeheartedly believe. It's also an invitation for those who have yet to make a decision to Jesus to say, come. Jesus is inviting you too to come and receive what he has for you. He may not make all of your problems go away, but he has this ability to give you supernatural hope joy, and peace, even in the most difficult of circumstances. So in just a moment, our ushers are going to come forward. They're going to dismiss you row by row. We invite you to come forward to any one of these stations. Uh, They're all the same. When you come up, you could take two cups if you're taking the cups from the silver plate because they're stacked on top. There's bread in the bottom cup, juice in the top cup, so you want to take a stack of two. If you need a gluten-free option, all of the prepackaged elements are gluten-free. We just ask that as you come up and you come through the middle aisle, you go to one of these side tables, and then you return to your seat through the side aisle. And then once everybody has their elements, we'll take them together. Lord, we thank you so much for what this meal represents. We thank you so much for the way that you have also endured hardship and suffering on our behalf, that you have not left us as orphans, as it says in John 14, but that you have come to us You have brought us into your family, that you are providing what we need right when we need it. So Lord, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, give us a heart that is open and willing to respond. Amen.